Well, welcome to our exploration of the livid horse. Behold the livid horse, or the pale horse, or the word is actually for a ghastly green kind of horse. We'll call him the livid horse. And so we're in the first of two sessions, and we are, of course, focusing on Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. And you'll, you're going to notice I'm going to emphasize the location of the scripture, because it's going to be more important to you than you probably realize at this point. So bear with me on that. And uh, session one is going to be the, uh, the livid horse of Revelation 6. And uh, you can see what an art department can do when you turn them loose. Because, <laughs> boy, that's a ghastly horse, all right. And our livid horse, or pale green, it's, a, it's actually the color of vomit, to be uh, frank with you. We're going to talk about that in session one. When we get to session two, we're going to talk about something much broader. The global background behind all this. The whole concept of deliberate diseases and the fact that there is a depopulation agenda among the globalists, something most people are too shocked to really admit when they run into it. And so, the Divine Kind, remember now Revelation chapter 1, gives its own outline in verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, John is told. Write the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta, hereafter. And so the things that he had seen by the time you get to the end of this chapter is chapter 1, which is a vision of Christ. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then next comes two chapters that are the most important chapters in the book. The seven letters of seven churches written by Jesus himself, writing our report cards in advance. And they're the part that really impacts us more than all the rest. You want to be aware of that. And then comes the third session from chapters 4 to, on, four to the end, the things which shall be metatauta, hereafter these first things. And so it's that key term translated in the King James as hereafter. It, the Greek term is metatauta. It's a, a marker, if you will, in partitioning the book. And uh, so the things which you have seen is chapter 1, the things which are chapters 2 and 3. The things that come subsequent, of course, is after chapter 4. And in 4 and 5, we have the saints in heaven. Chapter 6 through 19, we have what we would call the 70th week of Daniel in detail. And we'll see six seals and six trumpets and six bowls laid out. Each one as a subsequent group of seven from the previous one. And so uh, it, it has been suggested by many, it almost appears like a logarithmic projection. Because the seventh seal is the, seven, the, the six trumpets. And the seventh trumpet are the six bowls. See, they're compressed in themselves in a sense. And so, and, but I want you to be sensitive to what we're going to be dealing with in these next, this session and next is in the sixth chapter of Revelation. For a lot of reasons that won't be clear just yet, it's going to be important for you to remember where you are in context, because many people are confused on that. So we're going to try to avoid that confusion. Metatauta. And in verse 4 then, after the seven letters, the first verse, that's what John encounters, after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be metatauta hereafter. And so this is, again, it's, the, it's this partitioning word. I'll call your attention, though, while we're looking at chapter 4, that in verse 5 there's something else people miss. The seven lamps of fire that were on the earth in chapter 1 are in heaven at this point. That's just a confirmation, confirming indicator of our perception here, architecturally. So in chapter 4, we are in the throne room of the universe. The throne of God in chapter 2 and 3 is, uh, we had the uh, 24 elders in verse 4, the, the uh, seven lamps from chapter 1 are showing, the sea of glass. It always fascinates me that you and I are washing in it, according to Ephesians 4, washing by the word, and there they're standing on it. And is that a pun? Yes, absolutely. And the Holy Spirit uses those. Then the four living creatures, the cherubim, with the famous four faces, and that's a study in its own right. But these 24 elders, I want you to really grasp that because this is not an optional understanding. This is something I believe is very fundamental. David divided the priesthood into 24 courses, and that's the only place that it explicitly occurs in the scripture in terms of the priesthood, 1 Chronicles 24. And uh, we also notice, though, in the first chapter of Revelation, the 24 identifiers of Christ were numbered 24 in number. There are 24 dispensational intervals that we'll talk about. 
These identity codes in, in Revelation chapter 1, there are 24 identities, and each one of those are used then in the rest of the book as identities pointed to Jesus. But it fascinates me that there's 24 of those. Okay? And we also have dispensational breaks. And if you search your scriptures, you'll discover there happens to be 24 of those. And they're listed, they're listed here so you can uh, dig them out. And the Daniel 9.26 being the most conspicuous one for most of us. The 24 intervals in scripture. But the 24 elders identify who they are. Because when you get to chapter 5 now, uh, we, it, it says, they, the 24 elders, they sung a new song saying, Thou, speaking to the Lamb, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I want you to notice that they identify themselves, us, 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 as kings and priests. There are only three people that that title is used to in the Bible. Melchizedek, and introduced in Genesis 14, would, in those couple of verses, would disappear into oblivion, except it's picked up by Psalm 110 and celebrated. And then two chapters in the, people, in the Epistle of Hebrews hammers that home to understand that the, the, the unique, the king and priest, Melchizedek, of course, the Messiah, and ourselves, strangely enough. So you need to grasp that, understand it, and dig into that. And don't accept that because I tell you that. That's a, you flunk. You need to dig that out and, and study it yourself and come to your own conclusion about that. But I encourage you to, to examine that carefully. Because in chapter 5, here's the key thing that's going on. John says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? And the initial reaction is pretty shocking. It says, No man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll and to look thereon. And, I, and John says, I sobbed convulsively, is what he actually saying, because no man was found worthy to open and read the scroll and look there. Now notice in each case here, it took a kinsman of Adam to be eligible. And no one was found eligible except one. We're going to find an exception, fortunately. But see, John, like them, he, 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 we don't know what's going on, but he understood. And he was shook up because there wasn't anyone eligible to take the book. And then he always gets explanations to himself from one of the elders. I think that's interesting. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not! Behold, this is the exception now, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I beheld him lo in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as it had been slain. Ooh! having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root, these are very Jewish titles. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, that's who we're talking about here. And it's the Lamb. It's fascinating to realize John the Baptist, when he first introduces Jesus to the public, he said, Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Passover title. And that's the title he used, and that's the captive title here. Okay, I want you, what, the what reason I'm hitting those so hard, you're going to need to understand, as you look at all four horsemen, they're a pretty grim group, especially the one we're about to encounter. I want you to re re refresh yourself on the sequence here. The 24 elders are in heaven, worshiping the Lamb before he receives the scroll. We're there worshiping him, and he hasn't taken the scroll yet. The seven seals. It's the Lamb that has the unique right to open those seven seals. No one else can do it. And his opening of the seals is what then sets these four horsemen, and a lot of other things, loose. You get that. It's going to be important. So we want to understand the livid horse, the last horse, all four horses. But we want to understand that's yet future. We're going to watch all of that I like to say it from the mezzanine. Uh, we won't be here. But the opening of the seven seal scroll, that's Revelation 6. That's what it's all about. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, he heard, as it were, a noise of thunder, and one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. And so we took, we've already taken care of that, of course. Then the second seal is the red horse. 
And, uh, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And the power was given unto him that he sat, had to set thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And horses are often used to designate judgments if you study your Old Testament. There's a lot of verses in your notes. You can chase that down. So that's the second horse. Then we got to the third horse, the third seal. And uh, when I opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And black is often connected with famine, if you look at your scriptures. There's a Jewish expression to eat bread by weight. In other words, as, as a form of scarcity. And, uh, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And so the, the, these are measures, of, typically a full day's pay is the amount that we're dealing with here. And uh, so the, 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 these were, and, and they got this for a penny, and that's an that's, uh, uh, amount that in, in, in his, historically it's, it's, it's a, each soldier in the army kind of number, and a day's wage, in other words. In other words, it, it, uh, you get uh, uh, one person fed for one day's wage, but that's not enough for a family. And so, so that's the black horse. Now we get to the primary subject that we're going to focus on in this session. The livid horse. He can be called the pale horse. Many people would call him the green horse. Uh, where I'm choosing the word livid because it is a little more distinctive, I think, because he's going to represent death, among other things. And when he'd opened the fourth seal, I heard the, f for, uh, the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, behold, a pale horse in the King James. And uh, that word is chloros in the Greek. It means pale, or livid, or ghastly green. It's the word from which we get the word for chlorine, by the way. But it's a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Strange set of words here. We're going to get into that. And power was given over them. See, it's a plurality. It's not one. It's two things there. It's death and Hades. We'll get into that. Over a fourth part of the earth. Wow. To kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And so that's the guy we're going to deal with today. And I would like to notice in Ezekiel 14, For thus saith the Lord God, How much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem? the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and pestilence to cut it off from the man and beast. Echoing, uh, I think, chapter 6 in advance. And as we've noted before, by the way, chapter 6, these events there have a parallel in the Olivet Discourse. Here we see a white horse rider, a red horse rider, a black horse, and a pale horse. Then there'll be some martyrs and worldwide chaos. When you get to Matthew 24, we have false Christs first, the wars, famines, death, martyrs, and worldwide chaos. In that same order is, is, is articulated. So I think that's provocative, it's worth your attention. Another comment that's perhaps interesting, I'm not sure it's uh, illuminating particularly, but we see that the six, the, what is it, the three, the seven, uh, seven uh, Muslim nations have those three, those same four colors in their emblems. You know, red, white, red, black, uh, and white, and so on. Something else that I think it's useful to, to understand when you're jumping into Revelation is what's called the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure. We're here encountering a seven-sealed scroll. But in these patterns, you're going to notice there's always a change of subject, a parenthesis between the sixth and the seventh. And uh, the, the, we have a parenthetical several chapters there. Uh, uh, well, it's chapter seven between before chapter six, when chapter six ends, there's a whole chapter having nothing, a whole change of subject before we get to chapter seven. And then chapter seven has seven trumpets, but there again, it consists of two chapters, eight and nine. When you get to the, after the sixth trumpet, again, there's several, there's a handful of chapters put in there as a change of subject, a, a catch your breath kind of thing. And then that, the, the, after that change of subject, we have Seven bowls, but even in the seven bowls, we discover that there is a 
change of subject, one verse, but it's a change of subject before you get to, again, you see, the, just be sensitive that the architecture is diligent. It should catch our attention that there is an architecture, that every detail, the nuance of every word is relevant to the originator. It's up to us to try to catch up with that. Okay, so the seven seal scroll. And so this is where we're going to encounter what I'm choosing to call the livid horse, or pale, or green. And uh, he certainly is a grim reaper there with his <laughs> livid horse. Okay. Now, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat was Death, and hell followed with him. And it's interesting, death and hell followed with him. And there's a plural in the, a plural in the following pronoun, so we, there's, there's two things in focus here. Death, uh, in the sense of Satan, and we're going to get into that. And there are two personages. Death claims the body, Hades claims the soul. These are quite distinctive. And it occurred to me that before going forward, let's, not, let's refresh our foundational perceptions of what those words really mean. One of the misconceptions we all have in our culture are misconceptions of Satan. And uh, we need to guard against the fables and distortions that are all through all the world's literature. It's amazing, every place you were in literature, most of what you see there is incorrect. Satan does not rule in hell. Quite the contrary, that's where he's confined as a prisoner when the time comes. Hell was created for him. Misconceptions about hell versus Hades. There are two different words I want you to be sensitive to. The Greek term that we encounter is Hades. Okay? The Hebrew equivalent word is Sheol. Hades is the Greek. Uh, Hebrew is the Sheol. There is another word entirely that we'll encounter called Gehenna. That's also in English translation, often translated hell, but that's confusing and misleading. There's also a term, the abuso, and I want to sort through these a little bit so we're not misled here. Now, it's interesting as you study hell, it's typically presented in artwork and what have you as fire and brimstone and as if Satan rules there and all that stuff, even though Dan's famous doors, whatever. They, these, these are all colorful pieces of literature and art, but they're not biblically correct. And that's what I want to do. The word hell is a widely misused and confusing term. Our English word is derived from the Saxon halan, which means to cover. Hence, it's the covered or invisible place. That's how it comes to mean, use hell. Helan means, in, in the scripture, there are four words that are often transferred into the English word hell. Sheol being one of them from the Old Testament in the Hebrew. We have Hades and, and Gehenna and Tartarus in the Greek. Those three Greek words, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus, show up on your English transfer by the name hell. And it'll be useful to you when you encounter them to correct, put the correct, so you understand what's really being talked about there. Let's go into that a little bit. Sheol occurs in the Old Testament 65 times. It's derived from the word meaning to ask or demand. In other words, the word is intended to convey insatiableness. It's never full, we're told in the scripture. Sheol. The word is rendered grave 31 times, but they're using that term connotatively. And there's a number of places that occurs. It's rendered uh, hell 31 times. Sheol is, Sheol is called grave, but that's a misunderstanding. I'll explain why in a minute. Sheol is rendered hell 31 times, and again, that's in the sense that it's the place of disembodied spirits. Now, the inhabitants of Sheol are the congregation of the dead, according to Proverbs 21. It's the abode of the souls of the wicked dead, clearly, in a number of passages in the Old Testament. It is also the abode of the good, strangely enough, in Psalm 16, 30, and a handful of places. And uh, Sheol is described as deep in Job, as dark, and with bars. Those are all descriptive uh, uh, terms for Sheol. The dead go down to it, is the, is the linguistic, linguistic treating of that. 
And so don't confuse Sheol with the grave. Because the grave, is, uh, sometimes Sheol is used connotatively to include the grave, but the grave and Sheol are actually quite distinctive. A grave is physical. It receives the bodies. It can be used in the plural. You can have, you can own several graves, more than one. You could have titled a, a bunch of those for your wife, your family, whatever. You can own graves. It's a piece of real estate you can have title to. And so, that, that, now, Sheol is singular, it's never used in the plural. In other words, it's a region, a singular, unique region. And uh, not in the plural. Graves, you can have plurals, obviously. Now, Hades is translated hell. It, it's a Greek word from that which is out of sight. So it's, it used, it's used to denote the place of the dead, Hades. It's translated hell in the English Bible 11 times. Septuagint uses Hades to translate the Hebrew Sheol. In other words, when you're translating from Hebrew to Greek, the Sheol becomes Hades. Okay, and so in the Greek it's associated with Orcus, the infernal regions, the dark and dismal place in the very depths of the earth, the common receptacle of all disembodied spirits. That's the concept, the Greek concept of Hades. In Greek concepts it had two subterranean divisions. This is interesting. Even in the Greek concept, there was a good place and a bad place in Hades. There was Elysium, the good place, and Tartarus, the bad place. So they would speak of hoping to go to Elysium, not Tartarus. And I would go to Hades, yes, but the, the better of two alternatives. You follow me? That was the Greek conception. And uh, so Hades refers to the abode of the unsaved dead prior to the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. Well, you'll encounter that when you get into that there. Hades is a prison according to 1 Peter 3. Hades is described with gates and bars and locks in Matthew 16 and Revelation 1. Hades is downward, we find in Matthew 11 and Luke. And the righteous and the wicked are separated in Hades. Not in the same place, they're separated. And uh, now some view the blessed dead as in the part of Hades called paradise. We'll come back to that in a minute. The other term that you find in Luke 16 is Abraham's bosom. That's a term used f for apparently the good part of Hades, in contrast to the wicked part. Okay, and uh, you'll discover most of what we think we know about all of these things comes out of Luke 16. Interestingly enough, the rich man and Lazarus, which is not a parable; it's an actual description. It's not a parable because the guy actually has a name. The the the, the beggar does. And so the rich man lifted up his eyes uh, to see the bosom of Abraham, which he could see, but it was afar off. There was an impassable gulf between him and that. And so Abraham's bosom is in heaven, we know from Matthew 8. Here it's used as part of Hades, the good part of Hades, same term. And so most of the early church fathers viewed paradise as a part of heaven, not Hades. Well, that's interesting. That sounds like a contradiction. Not exactly. The two compartment view that we talk about is an accommodation to the Greek conception. And so Gehenna is a different word altogether. It originally was uh, Gebene Hinnom, which is the valley of the sons of Hinnom. It is a deep, narrow ravine to the south of Jerusalem, separating Mount Zion from the so-called evil, evil council. It was at that place, in that valley, that the idolatrous Jews offered their children in sacrifice to Molech. And that's in the Second Chronicles and Jeremiah and elsewhere. And so, uh, so Gehenna becomes an idiom then for hell as you and I think of it, as a final place for the losers, if you will. But that is not there yet. That's where Hades, the, the, the negative part of Hades, will end up in. So Gehenna is the valley that afterwards then becomes a city dump, and a fire was continually burning there, because it was a city dump. And so it becomes a metaphor, if you will, for a place of everlasting fire and burning. So it becomes a, a linguistic metaphor, Gehenna. And in this sense, that term is used 11 times by Jesus. In the sense of the, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone and so forth. And uh, they're all listed there in your notes, so you can go through them and check them out.
It's the, the, Jesus calls it the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And again, though, that's a metaphor. It isn't fire and like oxidation. Fire is used as a metaphor. So it's important for you to distinguish between hell, the English word, that's translating Hades or Gehenna. Hades is temporary. Hades does not last forever. It ultimately, Revelation chapter 20, Hades will be cast into Gehenna. Okay? Gehenna is forever, which simply means it's outside the dimensionality of time altogether. And you and I can't grasp that. To be without hope indefinitely, that's a concept we can't grasp. Hades is in the earth. It's always used as a term that's geocentric. You look at it, 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 the only place a bottomless pit can occur is in the center of the earth. And so it seems to be associated with a bottomless pit, the abuso, the abyss. And if you study topo uh, topology, that's the only conclusion you come to. The only place there's no bottom is in the center of, of, of a sphere, and it has no bottom. Now there's another subtlety on Gehenna. It is not the outer darkness that we see references to. That's widely misunderstood. It's a whole other study. Now there's another term that comes up in the Bible only once called Tartarus. It's translated hell in only, and it's only one use in 2 Peter 2.4. What does Tartarus mean? It's the deepest abyss of Hades. In Homer's Iliad it's described as, as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. Well, I don't know what, it, what it's like, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> as far below Hades as the earth is below, that, that sort of gets it. It's the specific place of incarceration of the angels that sinned. It's alluded to specifically um, from the Genesis 6 experience in both 2 Peter 2, Jude 1, 6, and another place. There's a third place, actually. Okay, so, so the abuso. That's another term that is the bottomless pit or the abyss or the abuso in Greek. This is what the beast of Revelation, remember the beast in Revelation 13, that's where he comes out of. We like to call him the Antichrist. That's an unfortunate label we use, but in any case, that's where he comes. He makes his first appearance, not in Revelation 13, but in Revelation 11. That's where Satan also is going to be bound. He's going to be bound in the Abuso for a thousand years. He doesn't rule there. He's imprisoned there for that duration. But it's also the place out of which the demon locusts come in Revelation 9. So you'll encounter the Abuso in a very special context. So one way I try to summarize this may be useful to you. I'll give you a map as the underworld, if I can lump this all together, is, is portrayed. Hades is a place of torment, and it's also a good place, a, a place of Abraham's bosom. Both of those are, in Hades apparently has a bad place and a good place, and there's an impassable gulf between the two. We learn most of that from Luke 16, but it clarifies a great deal. And so we also find allusions then to the bottomless pit. Now, is that part of the impassable gulf? Who knows? But it's certainly not a good place, and it's not associated with Abraham's bosom particularly. But uh, uh, this is one perspective here. Tartarus may be a synonym, conceptually at least, for the bottomless pit. We don't know. Okay. Now, the rich man in Lazarus in Luke 16 is a place where you can learn a great deal if you take the time to really study it. The man in Hades, the rich man, was fully conscious. He wasn't asleep. He was aware and very conscious. He had a memory. He knew his history. He's speaking. He can articulate. He has pain. And he's a deep desire for a drink of water. So it tells you a lot about he's got, he's got a palpable existence. But his eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed, without hope. If we, we can't imagine that. He knew that what he was experiencing was fair and just. That's a surprise. He makes no complaint. He acknowledges that what is happening is appropriate. That's amazing. He also knew what his brothers would have to do to avoid his fate. He pleads for them, but he understands that if they stay on their course, they're going to end up the same way. He understands their need for repentance. And by the way, it was not yet in hell, that in hell as we think of it. Only Hades, okay? Not hell in the Gehenna sense. 
So here we are. That's the model I'm going to suggest to you. It has one little problem, and that is those in Abraham's bosom, we believe, were taken with Christ after the cross. And that may help the, because the, he promises the prisoner that was saved that this day he would, that he would be with him in paradise. And so that's why we infer that the, the Abraham's bosom was cleaned and moved, so to speak. And that seems to explain a great deal if that's, the, if that's correct. 1 Peter 3.19 is an allusion to all of that if you want to track it down and do your own homework there. But let's just dismiss the misconception of Satan. He does not rule in hell. Hell was created for him. There are two prevalent myths about Satan. Two myths, and they're both wrong. The first is that he doesn't exist. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't believe he exists should try resisting him for a while. Become very clear. The other myth is that he was that he has uh, that uh, that you need need to understand that he has locality. He's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at a time. So that's a that's a, a limitation we should be sensitive to as we explore some of these things. Okay, getting back to Revelation six and so forth. He opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth beast. They come and see. I looked. Behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. And it's those two are two personages. Death claims the body. That would be the grave, if you will. And Hades claims the soul. They're distinctively different destinies. Okay. But then Revelation 6, 8 continues. We just took part of it. So then power was given unto them. Notice the plurality. There's two of them, death and hell. The power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth. One person in four. Wow. To kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now, a fourth part of the earth. I don't know if we can picture that. But try. One fourth of the earth. Wow. And they're, they're killed with sword, hunger, and death, and with the beasts of the earth. And some of the most dangerous beasts are not four footed animals. They're microscopic. And we want to broaden our horizon on that. There's all kinds of beasts, and some of them are not necessarily visible to their naked eye. And uh, we, we shift back to the Oliver Discourse, where Jesus says, For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. The word pestilence occurred in Ezekiel, it includes here in the Oliver Discourse. But the other verse that needs to come home to our thinking here is verse 22 of Matthew 24, the Olive Discourse, where Jesus highlights the fact that except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's a technology statement. That statement probably wouldn't have any real relevance to us if we were listening to it in the early centuries. But in today's world, it's painfully imminent on our horizon. There's all kinds of ways we haven't even talked about that a small group of people could wipe out the entire human race today because of technology. There should no flesh be saved. That's a technology statement. So our agenda for the rest of the session will be to take a look at reemergent diseases, biological weapons, and defenses to these things. Now there was a time that you may remember when the medical profession felt that they had the major diseases licked. And for the rest, it was just a matter of time. They would list this one and that one that now is under control and things are getting better. Yes, there's still a few we're working on, but you had the general assessment that we're winning, except that isn't descriptive. Now their confidence seems tragically uh, premature. Many of the old once licked diseases are making a comeback in hardier strains than ever and resisting our once effective treatments. We're losing ground in a number of key fronts here. Tuberculosis is an example. There are now newly highly resistant strains of TB that are of increasing concern. There's an airborne germ that has been known to carry HIV, among other things allowing it to piggyback and become contagious in the air. That's a, that was a shaking, uh, 
shattering discovery when that was first realized. Okay, Staphylococcus aureus, if I'm pronouncing it properly. Staph bacteria are the number one cause of hospital infections. They are blamed for 13% of the nation's 2 million hospital infections each year, which kill somewhere between 60 to 80,000 people every year. Staph, very common, very feared in hospitals. Now there's a new strain of staph that shows resistance for the first time in vancomycin, which has been around since 1970, was used when other antibiotics failed, but now even new strains of staph are showing resistance to that. In other words, the fight is getting tougher, not easier. This increasing resistance is attributed to the overdose of antibiotics and the failure of some patients to take their medicine properly. One of the things your doctor will emphasize when he gives you an antibiotic is don't stop taking it. People will take it, they seem to be getting well, so they, they don't finish the prescription. Big mistake. Because what they're doing is the, the, the hardy ones will still survive, and they will, the most hardy ones are the ones that survive. You're not finishing the job. It's important to see it all the way through is the point. If you, fin if you pause halfway through, you're giving it a chance to win, so to speak. Some, people take, some patients take their medicine once they feel better, but before the infection has been knocked out, enabling the hardiest germs to survive and multiply. And that's what they believe is happening. That's why there's new strains of staph that they're encountering that are fresh and new and different. Then we have the issue of Ebola. I'm just, by the way, you can go through lists of these, but I just took a few. The Ebola virus kills as many as 90% of its victims in a little more than a week. So when it hits, it hits hard. Connective tissue liquefies, every orifice bleeds. In the final stages, the Ebola victims become convulsive, splashing contaminated blood around them as they twitch, shake, and thrash to their deaths. And for Ebola, there is no known cure. No specific treatment or vaccine for the virus is available, although a number of potential treatments are being studied. Supportive efforts, however, improve outcomes. The disease was first identified in 1976 in two simultaneous outbreaks in Nathara and also in Yambuku, a village near the Ebola River which, from which the disease gets its name. Between 1976 and 2013, the World Health Organization reports a total of 24 outbreaks involving 1,716 cases. The largest outbreak is the ongoing epidemic in West Africa, still affecting Guinea and Sierra Leone. As of 9th of May of 2015, this outbreak has caused 26,693 reported cases, resulting in over 11,000 deaths. So that's the quick snapshot there, and it's, it's very localized, fortunately, but still very serious. Well, that leads us to another topic that's related, that's biological weapons. See, if chemical attacks seem frightening, a biological weapon is even a worse nightmare for several reasons. Chemical agents are inanimate, but bacteria, viruses, and other live agents may be contagious and reproductive. They not only reproduce themselves, they mutate. If established in the environment, they may multiply. Unlike any other weapon, they become more dangerous over time. Let's take a look at a couple of these. Probably the number one is anth anthrax, Bacillus anthracis. Rod-shaped, gram-positive, anaerobic, sporulating microorganism. The spores constituting the usual infective form. It causes anthrax, is the common term. If the bacteria are inhaled, symptoms may develop in two to three days. Initial uh, symptoms <coughs> resembling the common cold, um, common respiratory infection, are followed by high fever, vomiting, um, joint ache, labored breathing, internal and external bleeding lesions, exposure may be fatal. Vaccines and antibiotics provide some protection unless the exposure is very high. This is the most dangerous bacteria a terrorist can use. Why? Because once released, it will present a problem for decades. 
The problem doesn't go away. Gennard Island off the coast of Scotland remained infected with anthrax spores for 40 years after biological warfare tests were carried out there in the 1940s. If Berlin had been bombed with anthrax bacteria during World War II, the city would still be contaminated. So anthrax is a, is a, is a big deal. Now, it's interesting that we, when we read about the mystery of Babylon, one of the things we discover is that Babylon is destined to reemerge in the world scene. You've heard me on that with those six chapters that you should read at one sitting. I've told you several times. Yet, it's interesting that when we study both Isaiah and Jeremiah's description, Babylon becomes ultimately uninhabitable. It doesn't just not become inhabited, it becomes un, not inhabitable. And one thought, possibility, not the only one, is it, is it biologically contaminated? It's provocative, because here's a city that is destroyed suddenly, quickly, very dramatically in Isaiah and Jeremiah, and yet at the same time, from that point on, is not inhabitable. And that's the interesting attribute of anthrax. Well, let's get on to another one, Yersinia pestis. And that's something that you think more as, as the plague. Rod-shaped, non-mobile, non-sporulating, gram-negative aerobic bacterium. Caused bubonic plague, the black death of the Middle Ages. Wow. If bacteria can reach the lungs, symptoms including fever and delirium may appear within three to four days. Untreated cases are nearly always fatal. And by the way, it was the first material used as a weapon. Strangely, way back then. Okay, come back to the vaccines can offer immunity and, and, and antibiotics are usually effective if administered promptly. So time is of the essence. The bubonic plague, that's the most common, transmitted to man by a bite of an infected flea typically. The disease being perpetuated by the rat flea rat cycle. The flea bites are usually on the lower extremities where the bacilli spread rapidly through the lymphatic symptom, enlarging the lymph nodes in the groin. The bacilli escape from the nodes, invade the bloodstream, and produce a generalized infection. Other parts of the body that are affected are the spleen, the lungs, and uh, the meninges. So the first recorded use of military uh, biological weapons occurred in the 14th century when an army besieging Kaffa, a seaport of the Black Sea in the Crimea, in Russia, catapulted plague-infected cadavers over the city walls. <laughs> so they used it as a weapon. It's the first recorded use of biological warfare, but uh, they find a way. Well, another form of plague is pneumonic plague. It's transmitted by inhalation, spreads rapidly until the entire lung is involved in hemorrhage, pneumonia process. The disease is usually fatal, the patient dying of suffocation and or general toxema. And the third type of plague is spetosemia, occurs as a result of gross invasion of the bloodstream by uh, plague bacilli, which cause small hemorrhages on the skin and mucous membranes. Death occurs before the pulmonary manifestations appear. And uh, uh, so we're moving on, there's botulinum toxin. Now this one really may surprise you. Botulism is the most powerful poison known. The cause of botulism is produced by Clostidium botulinum bacteria. Symptoms appear 12 to 72 hours after ingestion or inhalation. Initial symptoms are nausea and diarrhea, followed by weakness, dizziness, and respiratory paralysis, often leading to death. Antitoxin can sometimes arrest the process. But we had an experience with this in the family, or I shouldn't say our family, next door neighbors to our family. Next door neighbors had a uh, celebration. It was Thanksgiving, I forgot. Was, they were celebrating some holiday. They had five generations aboard. They had the grandparents and the parents, and you know, had five generations. And among other things, they were celebrating eating some foodstuffs that came from the old country, from Italy. And uh, so they had this party. And before morning, before morning, four generations were dead. The only ones that weren't, there were a couple of small children that survived, 
because they hadn't eaten any of the preserves that had come from the old country. And they had a case of botulism. And uh, that, sh that shakes you to have those generations. Overnight, by morning it was over. And uh, anyway, moving on here. Other agents include a vibrocoma, that's cholera, and typhoid fever. And these, this is just excerpted from a long list of possibilities of biological agents that can be weaponized, rendered in some form to administer to others. They are very, very dangerous because they're hard to handle, because they are so dangerous. And uh, uh, they're, they, so they become a terrible weapon militarily because of all of that. But it turns out they're a dream weapon for a terrorist because he doesn't care. So they're not good military weapons, and there's, there's still a lot of studies on that, but they're usually not very attractive. And by the way, to get into this business, it, you can grow an arsenal very simply, because these things typically divide every 20 minutes. A single bacterium gives rise to more than a billion copies in 10 hours. A small vial of microorganisms can yield a huge number in less than a week. For some diseases, such as anthrax, inhaling a few thousand bacteria, and collectively that's smaller than the period on the sentence here, can be fatal. Inhaling an amount that's smaller than the period on your paper can be fatal. A major biological arsenal can be built within a ten, with $10,000 worth of equipment in a room 15 feet square. It's not hard. One can cultivate trillions of bacteria at relatively little risk to oneself if, if you have gear, no more sophisticated than a beer fermenter and a protein-based culture, a gas mask and a plastic overgarment. It's all you need to get into business here. It can be that simple if you do it very carefully. You can be an arsenal for a terrorist. Now, of course, the military has really spent money trying to chase these things. They have a thing they call the Biological Integrated Detection System. And I could take you through all the details. It's a waste of time. Because despite all the money and all the performance here, it doesn't work unless you know what you're dealing with in advance. And once you have some, it takes you a long time to figure out what you've got. It's not obvious. So trying to defend against this is very expensive and frankly not very practical. It's rather fanciful. A large population cannot be protected against a biological attack. That's a reality. Vaccines can prevent some diseases, but unless the causative agent is known in advance, such a safeguard may be worthless. Antibiotics are effective against specific bacteria or classes of biological agents, but not against all of them. Moreover, the incidence of infectious disease around the world has been rising from newly resistant strains of bacteria that defy treatment. In this area of biotechnology, novel organisms can be engineered against which vaccines and antibiotics are useless. You can take these things and engineer them, change them. Anticipating that research can come up with a defense against attack organisms whose nature is not known in advance appears fanciful. You can go through a lot of reports and wade through this stuff. The net, net bottom line, you're, you're kidding yourself. They deal with cocktails. You know, what, that's the term they use for combining a wide variety of biotoxins, poisons produced by living organisms, nerve agents, vesicants, those are blistering agents, and some biological agents, such as bacteria and fungi. You, know, you can mix these different kinds of things for different effects. They call them cocktails. They also may include a number of Soviet binary series of ultra-lethal toxins that even in microdoses can be debilitating. In addition to inducing meiosis, vomiting, memory loss, involuntary emotions, internal organ dysfunction, these toxins can have mutagenic effects, have no known endos. Now meiosis is simply the constriction of the pupil of the eye relative to the amount of light it receives. And uh, mutagenic is simply a term meaning a permanent change in hereditary material involving a physical change in chromosome relationships or a biochemical change in the con uh, condoms that make up the genes. So that's a world 
of engineering and counter-engineering that will go its own way. In mid-1986, the UN inspectors uncovered evidence that the government of Iraq was at that time conducting research over a dozen different pathogens, including E. coli, Escherichia uh, coli, and uh, recombinant DNA to create genetically altered microorganisms. Alterating DNA plasmids, the extra chromosome ring of DNA that replicates autonomously in bacteria, and vectors, that's an organ that transmits a pathogen, can be specifically tethered to avoid detection. Both the thing you're sending and the way you send it can be designed, engineered. If an adversary is successful in developing such agents, diagnosis will continue to elude physicians treating traditional diseases, obviously. Well, <laughs> Man tells us that the world is getting better. That's the flavor of most press, of course. God says they're going to be increasingly worse. That's the net of all this. Man says that peace among nations is close at hand. God says there'll be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdoms, and so forth. Man expects to win the battle against disease, famine, and hardship. He expects to win that battle. God says there is to be fearful judgments of disease, famine, and hardship. Well, wow. so, the encroaching darkness, you hear me talk a lot about this. I think that's the primary reality that we're facing. As we continue to see corruption everywhere, throughout the highest levels of government, in our entertainments, in our schools, in many of our churches, but after this, I think you'll also begin to realize, even in our medical establishments, and we'll touch with those, some of those in the next session, Many of those in the corridors of power should be incarcerated for treason. Legislators that sign bills they haven't read, executives who are allowed to ignore the laws, judges who reverse the juries, amend laws, and indulge in social engineering, that's not their job, leaders who fail to exhibit the most elementary ethical conduct. The entertainment industry celebrates every imaginable evil and attracts all the family values which God has established for our welfare. And our educational attachment deliberately dumbs down and corrupts our youth. That's the plan. It's not a failure, it's, the, it's an achievement. There was a day when you could rely on the fiduciary posture of our advisors, counselors, and professionals. Today, that would be naive and hazardous. Every day, the litany of non-constitutional abuses continue unabated. Every day, self-destructive policies extend their reach. Every day, it grows darker. Every day, the debts grow larger. They are already beyond any semblance of reality. And it's not our job to predict the future. Let's be careful with that one. Divination is prohibited in the Torah. The key is not to predict the future, but to be prepared for it, whatever it brings. It is our responsibility to prepare for the coming storms. You have a family, you have a community, and that's the burden you have. The Bible instructs us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And some of those devices are going to shock you when we get to session two. Paul warns us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And it's for a better understanding of those forces that we will next explore some of the most bizarre events of the American history. We're going to jump right into some of those. We're going to explore deliberate diseases, diseases that were designed, predicted and designed and requested and funded and tested and then specifically directed against specific groups of people. Shocking. We're going to talk about the depopulation agenda Many of us talk glibly about the globalists that would like to create a global government. Most of us are probably deaf or blind to what their agenda is regarding population. There is a, a directed commitment to depopulate the planet Earth down to a more manageable level is their concept. So I want to warn you, this coming session may be damaging to your confidence in the current medical environment and the personal hygiene. It's going to be very challenging in that regard. We're going to take a broader view of the warfare which is already underway. This is not a future thing, it's a now thing. So with that, let's have a word of prayer. 
Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for bringing us together in this gathering. We do pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and lives to what you have here for us. And through your word and through your Holy Spirit, you would help us to discern just what it is that you would have of us in the days ahead. As we commit ourselves with no reservations whatsoever, we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of our coming King, Yeshua, in whose name we commit all these things. Amen.